American Graduate Getting to Work is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact, as concussions in high school sports continue to rise, there's a treatment some say produces amazing outcomes. We'll meet a family affected. We'll also meet the newest group of Opportunity Scholars at Central Piedmont Community College and learn how last year's group is making a positive impact on campus. And hold on folks, we are headed back to the future with the Charlotte Symphony. Carolina Impact starts right now. Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. School-aged children visit the emergency room 2.4 million times in a year, and 6% of those visits happen because of concussions. The top five sports for this injury include football, soccer, bicycling, basketball, and playground activities. Many school systems, including Charlotte Mecklenburg, have concussion protocols these days to help students heal from their brain injury. But some have suffered more than one concussion, and recovery can get complicated. There's a way to treat concussions that you may not have heard about before. Carolina Impact's Jason Terzas explains. Lloyd with Morgan streaking. She's chipping the goalkeeper! Off the post and in! Patrick for Lloyd! The United States victory over Japan in the 2015 Women's World Cup Final was the most watched soccer event in the history of American television, with over 25 million people tuning in. The popularity of star players like Alex Morgan and Carly Lloyd have led to a new generation of girls taking up the sport. But the more girls who play, unfortunately also means the more who also get hurt. The total number of reported concussions has doubled in the last decade, with up to 10% of all players suffering at least one. The most common cause? Colliding with another player. And out of nowhere came this kid, and we collided, and I fell back and like hit this side of my face on the concrete. Hannah Johnson's concussion didn't happen on the soccer field. It happened on the school playground when she was just eight, and it kept her away from the sport she loves. Passed out, her vision got really blurry, she actually couldn't see for a few seconds. MRIs and CAT scans came back normal, but with a nasty black eye, Hannah rested at home for two weeks. No school, no reading, no TV. Whenever we would go outside, I'd have to put on a pair of sunglasses, which was like embarrassing. And then the summer came and she had, you know, a good couple months off from school and all of that and just recovered very normally. But just nine months later, it happened again, this time on a merry-go-round. And she couldn't reach the floor to stop herself. And so she was spinning so hard and so fast that the rotational spinning caused her concussion-like <laughs> symptoms to return. But it didn't really stop over time. Like, if I would do certain things, I would feel it again. And I knew that was a normal... Dizziness, uh, headache, sensitivity to light, you know, all the things that we had experienced already. Months went by, but Hannah would still occasionally feel foggy, lightheaded, and had some difficulty sleeping. After seeing multiple doctors and physicians and physical therapists, I mean, we went, you name it. Hannah got the news from doctors she was dreading, no soccer, not for a full year. And I remember every time they'd tell me like, you can't play soccer, and I'd walk out of there crying because I just wanted to play again. And when we had to take that away from her, it sort of burned out a little spark in her, and that broke me. Cindy Johnson desperately wanted to help her daughter, but didn't know how. Nobody could help us on the mainstream path of physicians and, and therapists. Finally came the break they were hoping for. A friend told Cindy about the Carolina's biofeedback clinic. We're sort of in between what the classic psychological approach is and what the classic medical approach is. They very quickly put my mind at ease that they felt like what they could do for her would help her. I remember walking into it and just being like, how is this going to help me? Like, is this just another doctor that's going to tell me I can't do anything? First up, a full assessment of Hannah's overall health. So we don't just talk about the presenting symptoms that they're coming with at that moment, but we look at their entire health history and the way that their brain and their nervous system has handled stress. And they did, then we develop an individualized neurofeedback plan for that client. Treatment started that day as Hannah was hooked up to various electrodes that measure brain waves. I just had to close my eyes. It was relaxing and then 
After like a few sessions, I could already notice that like I was feeling better. So what exactly is biofeedback? Well, without getting too technical, it's the process of using electrical sensors to measure physiological activity, such as brain waves, heart function, muscle activity, breathing, and skin temperature, and then using that information in conjunction with changes in thinking, emotions, and behavior to support desired changes. Biofeedback promotes relaxation. It's been found effective in a number of issues, including migraines, sleep issues, and attention deficit disorder. Some people use one thing, um, others may use two, three, four, five of our techniques. Uh, it just depends what we're, what we're kind of going after. Melanie Berry has her master's degree in psychology and is board certified in biofeedback. She owns and operates the Carolinas Biofeedback Clinic. She helped develop a plan for Hannah, which included 20 sessions over several months. After a while I started to enjoy it because I would just go in and it would be like relaxing and I would just sit there. It made her feel better. She would leave feeling better than when she went in. Over time, Hannah's symptoms became less frequent and wouldn't last as long until the point where they finally went away. And now I can do everything I want, like whenever I want, which is really great to not have to stress about it all the time. Now in eighth grade, Hannah is in her third full soccer season since returning and feeling better than ever. She wears a concussion headband just to be on the safe side. She is at the top of her game, both socially, academically, um, athletically. She is exactly who she wants to be right now. And I didn't know for a period of about six months to a year if I'd ever see that again. To say that I'm over the moon and elated would be an understatement. Although growing in popularity, biofeedback isn't considered a mainstream medical practice. Critics question how it compares with more conventional methods, but for Hannah, the results speak for themselves. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Terzis reporting. Thanks so much, Jason. If you want to explore biofeedback, you need to know it's often not covered by insurance. Talk to your doctor first and do your research on both the biofeedback treatment options as well as the cost. Well, getting through high school can certainly be tough, but for some teens, High school graduation marks the end of a journey instead of the beginning. Many students have options they never thought possible thanks to the Central Piedmont Community College Opportunity Scholarships. Now in its second year, selected students get free tuition and books, a laptop and a career coach to help students earn an associate's degree. In fact, one of the students who began the scholarship program last year is this year's student government president. As part of our American Graduate Getting to Work initiative, Carolina Impact's Tanisha Johnson introduces us to more of these Opportunity Scholars. Starting the first semester of college can be exciting. I'm ready. And nerve wracking at the same time. For Opportunity Scholar Ashley Hernandez, she's just trying to focus on the road ahead. I'm about to give it my all. Like I didn't just come to school to do nothing. She's determined to succeed and pursue her future, but it wasn't always that way. She didn't know how she was going to pay for college and due to astigmatism, her vision was getting worse every day. There's like no blind nurse that I've heard of. She feared losing her future as well as her sight. I couldn't read little signs when I was driving, like the signs on the road. Surgery restored her vision and she earned a full scholarship to CPCC through its Opportunity Scholars program. So it's just like, okay, here's your future. <laughs> It's a future that's now providing a $10,000 scholarship to cover her tuition, books, and fees for two years. The Opportunity Scholars Program is comprehensive in helping students find a meaningful career with better pay to take care of themselves and their families. In its second year, Opportunity Scholars are doing more than succeeding at CPCC, and Nicole Bonilla is proof. She was elected student government president this year. She also managed to keep a 4.0, make the National Honor Society, and start a volleyball club, and she's not alone. This first group of Opportunity Scholars knocked it out of the park with a 90% retention rate, a quarter of them making the deans and the president's list, and two of them landing full-time jobs already. With that in mind, they certainly have set the bar high for this next group. Thanks to each of you uh, for being here this afternoon as we gather to celebrate the Opportunity Scholarship Program and the students. CPCC President Dr. Candy Dietemeyer is proud of their achievements. I think they came in and they really exceeded their own expectations. What, what I think is most important is that we build a program that the scholars can participate in and be successful. Scholarship we donor Howard Levine you know, says at this good. rate, if students keep it up. Then I think we found something that could really make a difference, not only to our city, but to our state. 
On for the ride of his life, Makai Richardson wants to make a difference in his own city. The West Charlotte graduate is learning heating, ventilation, and air conditioning skills, better known as HVAC. Makai has lived without heat and air before. So I feel like I, I want to better other people so they don't have to go through what I went through, because I went through it at the at the toughest times when it was hot outside and it was really, really cold outside. And it's those tough times that Makai knows will help him push through challenges even in school so that in no time he'll be ready to work. But I want to work in like a company first to like learn it, learn how a company work and then start my own and be successful, like help out friends and family if they need like actual job. As the group of scholars move ahead, they'll have a ton of support to get them through the next two years, including peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. To have somebody that says, did you go to class today? Did you go to tutoring today? Did you go see an advisor today for next semester's advising? How are you, how are you doing? And, you're, and just to have that, um, I always think peer-to-peer -peer mentoring works well. And getting tips already from SGA president and 2017 Opportunity Scholar Nicole Bonilla is even better. Did anybody tell you to read the syllabus? Read it word for word. Nicole is definitely a success story, but that comes with added pressure. It's very nerve-wracking because they have that vision that, oh my gosh, she's so smart. She does a lot of things, she impacts people. So I gotta do that. Nicole is up for the challenge and so are the new opportunity scholars like Makai and Ashley. It's even changed the way they see their own future. It's brighter than I thought it would be and um, I had expectations in the past, but now I have like real expectations. Like they're about to get done. Like it's about to be real. <laughs> and her mom is thrilled. More than 100% I'm proud of her because I know how hard she worked. Being in the driver's seat has new meaning for Ashley. Opportunity Scholars is guiding her and the other 55 students on the road to success. There are now 95 Opportunity Scholars, and who knows, what they accomplish now may give hope and new vision for other Opportunity Scholars down the road. Tanisha joins us now, and Tanisha, I love seeing these students, and I love the excitement and the enthusiasm, and to see that young woman go from the potential of not going to college to be the student mm -hmm. government president is really exciting, and what kind of message do you think that sends to other Opportunity Scholars and folks throughout the whole community? Well, I think overall that not just only her, but anybody can do not only what she's done, but so much more beyond that. I think it gives students the encouragement to know that, hey, this is just one step in my journey and I have something else to look forward to. It's so exciting, and I know that this was created to help improve economic mobility in the Charlotte region, to have these opportunity scholarships. Do we feel that this is really on its way to leading to transformation? I Not only do I believe it, but I know that those at CPCC believe it, and those in the community, because what we're seeing is now we have almost 100 students in the program, and then after that, with this program for this year, we've got now more donors who are contributing to the effort, so most certainly it has definitely become something that I see in the future as uh, being successful. A way for students to get a leg up, to get the education that they need to go out and to earn a living wage is really, it is, it's empowering, it's transformational like you say, but it's also fun for us to be able to watch these young people's journey. And you've been chronicling it for us now for over a year. We do a story in the fall and a story in the spring. What do we expect is coming up when we see these students again in the spring? So coming up, we can definitely look forward to seeing students getting jobs, probably even before they graduate but we can also look forward to students going on to four-year universities and even getting some sort of internship to further their education or even their career as being as successful as they want to be. Well, we want them to be successful. Our community needs it to happen, and it's great for them to have this opportunity to get the education they need. Tanisha Johnson, thank you so much for following these students for us. Thanks. As we continue to explore this awesome region, we're always a little surprised by what we find. Did you know that Charlotte is home to one of the country's only brick and mortar chess centers? And you don't have to be a member or a pro to join. Carolina Impact's Danielle Koser introduces us to the 27-year-old chess champion turned entrepreneur. Two opponents, each armed with 16 pieces. Russia fight for victory on a 64 square battlefield. Chess is a classic game of strategy and skill. 
earning a spot in dozens of Hollywood blockbusters. From Harry and Ron playing a nearly deadly game of wizard's chess in the Sorcerer's Stone. You there, D5! To Sam, played by Samuel L. Jackson, using the game as a teaching opportunity in the 1994 film Fresh. This ain't checkers. For many, it's a hobby. Your rook's in danger by a piece that's only worth three. But yeah, chess enthusiasts turned entrepreneur train. Peter Giannatos yeah. found a way to capitalize from the game. I'm what's considered a FIDE master, which, uh, you know, that puts me in the top 1% of all competitive chess players. Yes, that's all competitive chess players internationally. Giannatos learned how to play chess at age seven and competed in his first tournament at age 13. By the time he was a junior in high school, I was co-organizing a chess club that met at a library. Giannatos remained an active member of the Charlotte chess community throughout college. During this time, he saw an opportunity and started planning his next move, opening a center devoted entirely to chess. And of course, you're calculating things out. You know, you're trying to guess what's going to happen next, but you never really know. And I feel like that part of chess imitates life a lot. And much like he was used to in the game, Giannatos took a calculated risk, opening the Charlotte Chess Center in March of 2014. We had built such great ties with the community that they were willing to contribute and help us build our own center. And we, we raised $30,000 through our member base to build this center. Two months later, he graduated from UNC Charlotte with a major in economics and a minor in political science. In chess, you can't, you often cannot see from start to finish. There's just too many possibilities. But you use your best judgment and you feel like as you're doing the right things, the right things happen. The center gives people of all ages a place wow. to play competitively okay. and train. Giannato says there's only a handful of centers like this across the nation. Fast forward four years and the center is thriving. Proof that the reward was greater than the risk. Basically the reward is being able to do something I love as a career, which um, not many people are able to do. So I, I cherish and, uh, and appreciate the opportunity to do that. Giannatos has traveled to Iceland and parts of Europe to compete in tournaments. For the most part, his competition days are over. Now he considers himself a coach. Currently your night's protected, right? On this day, elementary age kids gather at the center for beginner camp, learning the fundamentals of the game. Cannot castle no more. So that's, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Bad thing, right? A lesson is followed by snack time, giving students a chance to show off what they learned. This is seven-year-old Chris Hoyle's second okay. week at camp. I like chess a lot. Chris is a chess champ in our family. Uh, he likes to challenge dad, but Chris is really, really good at chess. <laughs> Chris sprained his ankle in May. Doctor's orders, take a break from sports while it heals. His mom, Marilyn, started looking for other ways to keep him busy. And so we really had to come up with something for him that would be challenging for him and really engaging. And we Googled chess places in Charlotte and we found Chess Center in Charlotte and we signed him up for two weeks of chess camp. We mostly um, talk about chess and um, we sometimes play each other. She makes the commute from Matthews to Charlotte in rush hour traffic to get Chris to camp. A sacrifice she says pays off. I love that he's in an environment where he sees the city because we're kind of in the suburbs and it's very diverse. Um, he's been in class with kids from India and China and I'm glad Charlotte has it. As for Chris, he's learning challenges aren't always physical. He was highly challenged. He was talking about mom, I learned how to do this and do that. So he would come back and he would play dad on the weekends and he would beat dad. I always try to um, control the center with my pieces. Giannato says he hopes these kids also learn lessons that go beyond the board, like good sportsmanship. Chess, a game of skill, not luck, also helps these youngsters sharpen their minds. Critical thinking is assisted by chess and just generally thinking ahead. Under pressure. As for Giannato's, he's also thinking ahead. His next move for the center, the next step for us is to open small branches for the suburbs, developing suburbs. We're looking further south in the Ballantyne Waxhaw area, and we're looking north, too. He also started the Charlotte Chess Center Foundation with plans of taking the game and the lessons it has to offer into Title I schools. For Carolina Impact, I'm Danielle Koser reporting.
Thanks so much, Danielle. That's a pretty awesome program that I'd never heard of before. Well, symphonies across the country are getting entrepreneurial too and boosting their bottom lines by partnering with classic movies. Where were you in 1985? I was a junior in high school. A very special movie came out that year that's been a favorite for generations. I'll give you a hint. There's a time-traveling DeLorean involved. I know you know the answer. Now orchestras across the country create movie nights to generate a whole new audience with a whole new revenue stream. So stand back as Charlotte Symphony takes you and me back to the future. Carolina Impact's Suzette Ree has more. Back in the day, many could have watched the movie Back to the Future at a local drive-in theater. The greatest time traveling adventure is back. You built a time machine out of a DeLorean? Well, times have changed, and this is how a new generation will watch the classic movie, thanks to the Charlotte Symphony. And even before they've seen the movie, of course, the DeLorean draws a crowd. What better way to introduce the symphony to a whole new generation? It's my first time seeing the movie. Um, I'm really excited. I grew up with the movie. Uh, I couldn't tell you how many times I've seen it, so it's cool to have her be introduced to this in this way. And this way of showing classic movies with a live orchestra is working in Charlotte and beyond. Symphonies all around the country have picked up this model because they've recognized its power, its unique power to connect with a community as, as large as Los Angeles and as small as Paducah. And what you also see is the multi-generational audience. The symphony understands that appeal as well. Hearing that music takes you back to that moment and you become 16 again, you become 21 again, you become two again, but you relive an experience. And then to be able to share that with your own family is something that is unique and special to our art form. The musicians feel that connection. Being on stage and playing the score from a movie also teaches great lessons about the role of music in a movie. This opportunity gives them a chance to realize that there is a symphony orchestra playing that music that they hear in the background. I mean, they, they can see us on stage and they can hear what we're doing and how it coordinates with the movie. A concert like this takes coordination of an orchestra to a whole new level. As the beloved movie plays on, so does the orchestra. The conductor and his special screen make sure the live music is synchronized to the action. The movie plays on the big screen to a packed house and the orchestra takes center stage. But as new as this live music experience may be for most of the audience, many are no strangers to the movie and its legendary character. Ah. Party! You made it! Yeah! So you know nights like this don't just happen. The musicians spend countless hours preparing. We caught them fine-tuning just hours before the performance. This multi-generational appeal to its audience for the Charlotte Symphony has very organic connections. On stage, the musicians are multi-generational as well. Take a closer look at the wind section. Sam Sparrow just turned 23. Gene Cavadlo just finished 43 years with the symphony. I am really impressed and blown away by the level of playing that I hear coming from young players. He's been so welcoming and he has just so much experience to share as well. Resident conductor Christopher James Lees believes these two musicians represent the essence and the power of the orchestra, an orchestra that was founded here in 1932 and supports 59 full-time musicians. What we get is a powerful representation of a piece of art that comes with the kind of vetted and stable maturity of an elder statesman and the vibrant, young, high-octane, pedal-to-the-metal sort of energy of the younger generation. And when you're on stage, you feel that electricity, and when you're in the hall, you can't escape it. I think it's a great opportunity 
a learning opportunity for them to understand how a symphony orchestra is part of the whole movie process. So I think this is really important for us to bring our whole community together to reach new audiences and just really show how great this music is. We amplify the orchestra so there's a live symphonic experience that gets on the hair of your skin and gives you goosebumps at the same time that you're sitting with your loved ones watching a classic movie that might be introducing the next generation to but is definitely loved by the older generation. Clearly this audience connected to the 1985 film. Classics have staying power and perhaps this pairing is more natural than you think. After all, who better to deliver a classic than the symphony? For Carolina Impact, I'm Suzette Reed. Oh, the memories that come back from hearing that music. Thanks so much, Suzette. The Charlotte Symphony has held four other movie nights so far. The Wizard of Oz, City Lights, Singing in the Rain, and Harry Potter. The Back to the Future concert exceeded attendance goals by about 10%, and 84% of those who attended had never been to a symphony event before. Congratulations to our incredible symphony on innovation. Well, that's all we have time for tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. We always appreciate your time and look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. Production of PBS Charlotte. American Graduate Getting to Work is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.